guys, and welcome to the Moms of Murder podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing all right. Just <laughs> <laughs> trying to get through the Florida storms that we have been having every single day, and it's been very stormy. Do you ever feel shocked by it? Because I'm always like, oh my gosh, it's raining again. Yeah. Meanwhile, I've lived here my entire life and this is just what like three or four months are. Just every afternoon it's storming and shocked every single time. Cannot believe it's happening again. Yeah. I don't know when I'll learn. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I feel like I've always, I always forget that that's how it is in the summer. And right? then, yeah, the summertime rolls around and I'm like, why is it raining all the time? Like this does not make any sense, but it does make sense because that's what it does here. Um, but yeah, so we are full force in the rainy season and it has been raining. I feel like it's been raining for like four days straight this week and it's been yeah. hard to get outside or do anything because it's like kind of off and on rain. But it's okay. Yeah, you can't plan anything. And then the weather app is always like, it's 40% at one o'clock. You're like, well, we got to be done by one. And then it moves it to four. And you're like, well, you lied to me again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to not trust you, you stupid app. So yeah. It's a thing. All right. So getting right into it this <laughs> week. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> no, no. I literally have nothing interesting to say. And I feel like we end up talking about the weather a lot in the beginning. Yeah. And you know, that's just, we are officially old. That's just what's happening. Yeah, there you go. So we talk about a lot of really unspeakable crimes on this podcast, but one of the horrifying things we don't talk a lot about are when minors actually commit a first degree murder. And I can only think of one other time. Actually, I can think of two times that we've talked about it on the podcast. The one was in the very beginning when we talked about Aaron Caffey and then I think the vampire cult killers, weren't they oh, minors? Yeah, they were teenagers. Yeah. I think some were probably older than 18, but I know the few were younger. You're right. Yeah. So we generally try to avoid talking about minors and kind of take these kind of stories on a case by case basis. But today's story, the culprit was actually just a few months from becoming an adult. So we kind of figured we could talk about this on the show. This is such a shockingly senseless and unimaginable murder. And we felt that it was worth sharing the story. So the double murder of Blake and Mary Jo Hadley made national headlines in 2011, but it took place in Port St. Lucie, Florida. And before we get into the details, we're going to tell you a little about Port St. Lucie in this week's segment of We Googled This City. Port St. Lucie is a tongue twister, by the way. It is. And I don't even understand exactly why, but I have a hard time saying it as well. So this should be fun. Um, also, if you don't like Google the City, this is a great one to fast forward because it's going to be terrible. If you <laughs> <laughs> like the corniness of it, this I'm really about to shine. Here we go. So Port St. Lucie, Florida is located near the southeastish side of Florida. So it's on the east coast, but it's almost between central and south Florida. I don't know where who claims it. Do you do you think it's more south? I, I think, think it's, it's more south. south. Right? Yes. Okay. So and as of the 2010 census, it has a population of around 164,000 residents. So we talked about peacocks a few weeks ago, and if you are among those who have a fear of peacocks, rightfully so, honestly, but Port St. Lucie may not be the best place for you. There's this area kind of downtown where dozens of peacocks, sometimes 40 or so of them, roam the streets, and I actually saw a funny photo of a guy trying to get a peacock off his car, which was very entertaining whenever you think of how aggressive they are and just this beautiful creature, <laughs> you know, going after somebody. And so this fact feels kind of familiar, and we may have talked about this before, but just in case, the flock of peacocks, like seagulls, but cooler, were likely from a flock that was imported by the actress and singer Frances Langford, who was one of the area's most famous residents. I feel like we've talked about that before because that is such a weird like somebody, no, you know what it was? It was, it was the Orlando. Yeah. Yes, that's what it was. How, how are people importing all these birds? Like, I, I don't even get it. As soon as it was out of my mouth, I'm like, nope, that's exactly what it is. You're right. So speaking of famous residents, actress Megan Fox spent a few years of her childhood in Port St. Lucie and even attended the St. Lucie West Centennial High School. Another resident of note is a man by the name of Robert Van Winkle. Back in 2004, Rob had a pet wallaroo named Bucky and a pet goat named Poncho. Mandy, is a wallaroo a real thing? Have you ever heard of it? I have not. <laughs> so I Googled it and I still didn't quite understand it. It kind of looks like a kangaroo to me. And are wallabies a real thing? Because if so, I think it might be a, a combination of a wallaby 
and a kangaroo. But I don't know animals, so I don't know. But it said <laughs> wallaroo. So both of these animals escaped from his Port St. Lucie residence. The animals roamed the town for more than a week before being reunited with Rob, and he later had to pay a $200 fine for expired animal tags and an undisclosed amount for the whole search and rescue of his pets. For their part, though, the pets were caught after they stopped, collaborated, and listened, and headed back to <laughs> Vanilla Ice's home. So lastly, back in the 1800s, here's where it really goes downhill. Pineapple farming was one of the area's largest agricultural industries. Uh, legend has it that one of the pineapple farmers thought his farm was cursed. And so do you know what he did, Mandy? He went to visit a local palm reader, and she told him the only way to break this curse was to throw his pineapple into the ocean. So he took a pineapple, threw it in the area known as Bikini Bottom, and a young sponge named Bob <laughs> found the pineapple, moved in, breaking the curse. And that's the origin story of SpongeBob that Nickelodeon doesn't want you to know. <laughs> It was just terrible no matter where I did it. So that's where we're ending it. And I love continue. That. I love that. That's like the best um, backstory for SpongeBob I've ever Isn't heard. Isn't it? I, I just love the idea of it being a dark story that they don't want you to know. I hate my brain sometimes. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Blake Hadley was a Florida native born and raised near Fort Lauderdale into a loving family. He was described as a fun-loving and silly guy who often made those around him laugh with his random acts of breaking into song or quoting comedy films with great enthusiasm. This reminds me of you, Melissa. Maybe oh. not comedy films, but comedy things. Quotations, right? Yeah, I was <laughs> yes. like, I totally get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as a child, Blake was kind and intelligent, and he was always in the top 10 of his class. After growing up in the Florida culture, whatever that is, um, if you live in Florida, you know what Florida culture is. It's the um, Florida grown tags. Everyone has a flow grown. Yeah. Tag. I don't even know what that yeah. means, but I'm always like, let's take this off, guys. Let's yeah. Do this. <laughs> so after growing up in the Florida culture, Blake decided that Florida was the place for him. And he stayed in the state and attended college at FSU, where he made numerous lifelong friends in the Chi Phi fraternity. It's unclear exactly when Blake met his future wife, Mary Jo, but it may have been in the time before he went off to college. Mary Jo was not born and raised in Florida like Blake had been. She was actually from Braddock, Pennsylvania, but her family moved to Fort Lauderdale when she was in high school. Although the two of them had very different appearances, their personalities seemed to be a perfect match. Mary Jo was quick-witted and delivered the type of sophisticated humor that would easily go over your head if you weren't paying attention. Melissa, I feel like you are both of the people at I was the same time. <laughs> I was about to say, this is where you're not going to say this is me because it's sophisticated and I yeah. just made a SpongeBob <laughs> reference. So, <laughs> yeah. So the couple was married in their early 20s and they were surrounded by friends and family who were nothing but thrilled that they had found each other. Both Blake and Mary Jo had a strong desire to raise a family, so shortly after their wedding, Blake took a job with Florida Power and Light, and the newlyweds moved to Port St. Lucie, where Blake's parents had already retired. The couple had their forever home actually built there, and they quickly welcomed their first son, Ryan. The new family soon joined a local church where they would remain active members for decades to come. When Ryan was six years old, Blake and Mary Jo learned that they were expecting again. This pregnancy wasn't as smooth as Mary Jo's first one, and she actually had to be induced about four weeks early. The baby was another little boy who the couple named Tyler. He spent the first three weeks of his life in the hospital NICU, and Mary Jo spent as much time as possible by his side. Once Tyler's lungs had developed enough, he was allowed to go home, but his struggles at birth weren't the only health problems that Tyler suffered through as a child. When he was just three months old, Tyler was infected with chickenpox, which can be life-threatening to an infant that young. As Tyler got bigger and the Hadleys started preparing to enroll him in preschool, they learned that their son had a hormonal imbalance, which was eventually linked to his thyroid. He was put on medication at the time to control the issue, but it was around the same time that Tyler was developing an obsession with becoming overweight. His preoccupation with his weight continued well into his preteen years. Tyler also had a taste for things that were dark and morbid, and he often made jokes about death, including his own death. Mary Jo was always a natural and loving mother, but sometimes her efforts to prove it meant that her boys got away with things they shouldn't have. She seemed to have a softer spot for Tyler and constantly felt guilty and responsible for his lower self-esteem and poor image. Mary Jo tried to keep Tyler grounded, and even as he grew more and more rebellious, she and Blake always made him attend church every Sunday. 
While the boys were growing up, Mary Jo worked as an elementary school teacher, and she remained active in her own kids' education. Although Tyler had his quirks, he was really a decent student and loved to learn new things in his younger years. Instead of attending the local public elementary school, Tyler attended Lincoln Park Academy, which is a magnet school that focuses on college prep from a young age. He didn't quite excel in academics, he mostly made B's and C's, but he scored well on the FCAT, which is Florida's comprehensive assessment test. I don't think we call it the FCAT anymore. Don't they call it the FSA or something else now? You might be right. I am not sure what they call it. I just know whenever everybody's kids are in the testing process that every parent is kind of losing their minds and scared right. and nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and teachers yeah. too, I'm sure. I like have flashbacks to taking the FCAT and it was not a fun time for me. I, just I feel like I it don't like might testing. Have, yeah, I don't I I truly do not remember taking it, so I don't know if maybe it started after I graduated, which will make me so mad if you're young enough that you got to be a part of this whole thing. <laughs> but um <laughs> but I don't think it was a thing. I think it really did start after or I'm too old to remember. It's one of those two options. Yeah. No, but you might I mean, you might just not remember. I feel like you take it twice or you take a it's in like 4th grade and then I think you do it again in high school. I really don't know much about it either, so I should not speak on it. We, we get it. You're young enough. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> so Tyler had several friends over the years, but his best friend was a boy named Michael Mandel. And these two boys were so close that Tyler often said he wished Michael's parents were his own parents and that they could be brothers. The best friends didn't attend the same elementary and middle schools, but when it came time for high school, they got their wish of being able to go to school together. Neighbors who lived near the Hadleys and watched Tyler grow up said that until his teenage years, Tyler was always very polite and respectful, and he always seemed to enjoy innocent activities like playing basketball and swimming in the family pool with his brother. But when he reached his teen years, he became more and more troubled as he started hanging out with the wrong crowd. Life at home was really pretty good for Tyler and his brother Ryan. Neither Mary Jo nor Blake was really fond of playing the role of disciplinarian, so the boys often got away with whatever they wanted. But anybody who knew the family would tell you that they definitely loved each other and they were always very affectionate towards each other. Some even describe Tyler as being kind of a mama's boy, which I hate that term so much, but that is because I have boys and my boys are definitely mama's boys. So I, like, <laughs> I hate when people use it in like a derogatory or a negative way. You know, it's like, it's not a bad thing. Moms love their boys. Um, but Tyler had this relationship with his mom and Mary Jo would really do anything for Tyler. But being a teenager in Port St. Lucie isn't really the most fun time. And it's a well-known problem around town that boredom leads to bad behavior. According to a Rolling Stone article written by Nathaniel Rich in 2013, the city of Port St. Lucie was never really designed for the younger population. When the city was first founded, it was filled with golf courses and assisted living facilities and things for the older population to do, like bingo and shuffleboard, and it was really clear who this city was made for. Unlike other areas of Florida, there was no such thing as going downtown, and there wasn't even beach access despite the fact that Port St. Lucie is right on the oceanfront. With really little option for entertainment, many of the local teens would turn to house parties and unsavory activities like burglarizing homes and vandalizing stores. During the time that Tyler was growing up, there was also a significant problem in the city with marijuana grow operations. Drug dealers that lived in Miami realized that they could purchase vacant homes for dirt cheap and they would install elaborate lights and hydroponic systems to cultivate marijuana. In 2006, there were 69 different grow operations dismantled in the city, but the problem still remains there today. It was in Tyler's first year of high school that he began dabbling in smoking pot himself. A neighbor who had known Tyler for his whole life alerted Mary Jo to the fact that her youngest boy was smoking, but Mary Jo seemed really unfazed. A short time later, Tyler and his friends started a fire in the River Park Wildlife Preserve that required the fire department to actually put it out, but the teen boys received little more than a warning. All throughout high school, Tyler found himself in these kind of sticky situations, and some were worse than others. He earned himself a record as a juvenile after he was convicted of burglarizing a home. At some point in high school, Tyler began experimenting with other substances. His drug of choice was ecstasy, but he tried numerous other things, including Xanax, crack, and heroin. 
In addition to being known for his drug use, he was also known around school as being somewhat of a storyteller who liked to embellish events that had happened or some that never happened at all. Most people thought he was odd, but he did have several friendships, and many of his friends had heard him make these morbid and inappropriate jokes about killing others or taking his own life. As he got further into high school, Tyler began skipping class frequently, and he tried to get his best friend Michael to ditch class with him, but Michael had higher aspirations and really wanted to do well in school. He urged Tyler to stop skipping school and to start to get his act together, but it was no use. And we're going to get right into what happens next after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. Kids make a lot of noise, whether they're playing or watching TV or just screaming for no reason. And there are times I need a break from all this noise and the theme song from SpongeBob while I do something much more exciting, you know, like the dishes, all while listening to some music or my favorite podcast. And I can escape the noise and do that with my Raycon earbuds. Whether I'm doing the laundry or walking around the grocery store, my Raycon stay perfectly in place in my ears and I'm not constantly getting stuck on a wire every time I turn a corner. Plus, the sound quality is outstanding, and my Raycons make those mundane tasks like doing the laundry and grocery shopping so much more enjoyable. Not only are Raycon earbuds so comfortable, the sound is crisp and clear, and they start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market. Their newest model, which is the Everyday E25 earbuds that we both have, are their best ones yet. They have six hours of playtime, so there's no need to charge them constantly. The Bluetooth pairing is seamless, plus there's more bass and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise-isolating fit every time. Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash momsandmurder. That's buyraycon.com slash momsandmurder for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. Buyraycon.com slash momsandmurder. I know I've been wanting to move to more natural products for a while now, but I believe that performance matters. And if you live in Central Florida, you know that deodorant isn't really an option and it has to work to keep you smelling fresh all day. But Native is up for the challenge and can do just that. And that's why we want to recommend all of our listeners check out Native. Native is made of ingredients you've heard of and can pronounce, like coconut oil, shea butter, and tapioca starch. It's also vegan and never tested on animals. But making the switch to aluminum-free deodorant doesn't mean you have to sacrifice on odor protection. In fact, aluminum actually forms a plug in your sweat glands, which keeps you from sweating, which is why Native never uses ingredients like aluminum, parabens, sulfates, or talc. According to the Native newsletter, as of June 23rd, Native has transitioned to plastic-free packaging for their deodorant. With over 10 cents, including rotating seasonals, Native has something for everyone's smell buds. Their most popular classic scents are coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, and citrus and herbal. Now that it's summertime, my favorite is coconut and vanilla. It's such a perfect scent for this time of year, and I feel good actually using it in the summer because it's working really great for me. Do what I did and make the switch to Native today by going to nativedo.com slash moms or use promo code moms at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash moms or use promo code moms at checkout for 20% off your first order. And now back to the episode. Before the break, we were getting into the many issues that Tyler Hadley was struggling with as a teenager and the way his life seemed to be spiraling out of control. His mom, Mary Jo, was always careful to keep her family problems to herself, but the things that Tyler was putting the family through were nothing like what she'd experienced with Tyler's older brother, Ryan. Although Ryan did go through a normal rebellious phase, he came out the other side mostly unscathed, but it seemed that Tyler was on a different path entirely. In the spring of 2011, Mary Jo confided in her niece, Kelly, about some of the things that were going on. Even though Mary Jo was technically her aunt, Kelly was just nine years younger, and the two of them were more like close friends than aunt and niece. Mary Jo told Kelly that Tyler had really been having a rough time in school, using drugs, stealing money, and sneaking around, and that she had decided to seek counseling for him at a place called Riga Mental Health Center. Riga offered a treatment program for adolescents and adults who needed intensive treatment but did not need to be an inpatient. Patients at the center are often treated for depression, bipolar, substance abuse, and eating disorders, and Mary Jo felt that Tyler was suffering potentially from many of those, so she believed that the program would be a good fit for him. 
The typical program had patients attending three days a week and for three hours each day, and it was covered by the family's insurance. So Mary Jo enrolled Tyler in the program. After attending several sessions, Tyler appeared to be doing much better, and he started being friendlier with the family and helping out more around the house. But it wasn't long after the program that Tyler returned to his rebellious and self-destructive ways. Tyler frequently stole his parents' cars and went out joyriding at night, and he soon began stealing money. Small amounts at a time, like $20, but it happened so often that Mary Jo had to start warning her friends and relatives to not leave their purses lying around. That's really rough whenever your mom knows, you know, the mom knows you can't be trusted to not yeah. steal money from her friends. That's, you know, that would be really tough. So Mary Jo's niece, Kelly, suggested that perhaps she start calling the police when Tyler acted out, but Mary Jo was adamant that she did not want to get the police involved. In the late spring of 2011, Tyler found himself in hot water again after he got into a brawl at one of his friend's houses that landed him in jail for a week on a charge of aggravated battery. Upon release, Tyler was put on two weeks of house arrest and Mary Jo imposed further restriction on him by taking away his cell phone. During that period, though, Tyler would get on Facebook to communicate with his friends and it was clear that he was really in a bad mental state. In a message to one of Tyler's friends named Isadora, he told her not to text his phone about drugs because he got arrested and his mom was, quote, flipping out about it. Later in the same conversation, Tyler told Isadora that he was contemplating suicide. Tyler continued to grapple with his relationship with his family. Things weren't that great overall between himself and his parents, but when Mother's Day rolled around a few weeks later, Tyler told her friend that he'd had a really good day with his mom. But the ups and downs continued. One night in June of 2011, Tyler once again got himself into trouble after going to a friend's house and drinking to the point of severe intoxication. He actually ended up urinating on his friend's bed before going home. When Mary Jo saw the condition her son was in, she'd had enough. She enacted the Florida Baker Act, which is a law that we have here in Florida that allows family to have their loved ones detained and examined by a professional to determine if they are a danger to themselves or others. Tyler was involuntarily committed to the New Horizons Mental Health Clinic and forced to attend daily counseling sessions. Mary Jo was on the brink of a nervous breakdown over her son's behavior. She herself had suffered with depression, and she worried that Tyler was also struggling with it. One of Mary Jo's co-workers at the school voiced concern about Tyler and what he was capable of. She specifically asked Mary Jo if she thought Tyler would ever hurt her, and Mary Jo said that she wasn't worried that he would hurt her, she was only worried that he would hurt himself. What Mary Jo may or may not have been aware of is that Tyler had made numerous comments to friends over the years about killing his parents. He would say these things often when he was angry at them, usually because they took some sort of disciplinary action against him, but Tyler's friends really heard these baseless threats so many times that nobody took him seriously when he said things like that anymore. Most of Tyler's friends were all well aware of the contention between him and his parents. So it was really odd when in July of 2011, Tyler started telling everybody at school that he was going to be throwing this giant party at his house. Tyler was known to talk a big game, and most who heard about this alleged party thought that he was just lying. But as the week continued, Tyler insisted that there would be a party at his house and that his parents would not be home. On Saturday, July 16th, at around 1.15 p.m., Tyler posted on his Facebook page with a post that said, quote, party at my crib tonight, maybe. Several of Tyler's Facebook friends began to comment on this post, and they were all, of course, typing in text speak and slang, but the gist of what they were saying was that Tyler was going to have this open house, and he said that his parents had not left yet, so everybody needed to wait to come over. Tyler told some people that his parents had plans to go to Orlando for the weekend, and he alleged that they were out running errands to get ready for their trip, but once they came home and packed their stuff and took off, it was party time. As the afternoon went on, there was more and more buzz on Tyler's Facebook regarding the party that he was throwing. One of his friends, who he had previously joked with about killing his parents, made a comment on Facebook that said, quote, if I kill your mom, will you put the Lincoln in my name? The Lincoln being, uh, this is actually Tyler's car that his parents have gotten for him. So the friend then followed up and said that he was kidding, but Tyler replied, no, I'm going to do it. 
So he made another post confirming that the party was going on and told people to start showing up at around 10 p.m. that night. One girl asked, what if your parents come home? And Tyler said, trust me, they won't. At this point in time, Tyler had already decided that he was, in fact, going to murder his parents that day. Although he had made up his mind about it, Tyler didn't think he'd actually be able to do it if he was sober, so at some point in the mid-afternoon, he took three pills of ecstasy and listened to music to hype himself up. Eventually, Mary Jo and Blake returned from an afternoon out and continued about their Saturday, completely unaware that their youngest son was about to kill them. Unbeknownst to either of his parents, Tyler stole their cell phones and hid them so that they would not be able to call for help. At around 5 p.m., Mary Jo was sitting at the family computer, which was located near the kitchen, when Tyler came inside holding a hammer. She didn't notice or hear him, and he stood behind her for five minutes, working up the nerve for what he was about to do. After Tyler delivered the first blow to Mary Jo, she managed to scream, quote, Why, Tyler, why? Blake ran into the room to see what was going on, and he was paralyzed with shock to see that his son was in the process of beating his wife with a hammer. When Blake screamed at Tyler and asked him why he was doing this, Tyler started screaming, quote, why the F not, repeatedly over and over again while continuing to attack his mom. After Mary Jo was dead, Tyler then attacked his father. During these brutal beatings, one of the family dogs started growling at Tyler, so he locked the dog in the bathroom and continued on with his plan. Something Tyler hadn't anticipated about the bludgeoning was the amount of blood evidence that would be left behind. He had to act quickly to clean up the scene before dozens of teenagers started showing up to his house for this party that he'd been talking about all week. First, he put a towel over each of his parents' heads and dragged them to the master bedroom. Then he returned to the living room to clean up the scene of the crime. And we're going to get into what happens next after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. Do you ever feel like you're making the same boring meals over and over again? I've felt that way more times than I can count. Not only is my family tired of eating it, but I'm tired of cooking it. And that's why I love using HelloFresh. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit and allows you to skip those grocery store trips and helps make cooking at home fun, easy, and even affordable. Let HelloFresh help you break out of your recipe rut with so many recipes to choose from each and every week. There's really something for everyone in your family, including their low-calorie option, vegetarian, plus family-friendly recipes, sure to make every person happy. HelloFresh offers fresh and high-quality ingredients in their meal kits every week, giving you a super flavorful experience. HelloFresh lays out each recipe with detailed instructions as well as pictures so you can feel confident every step of the way. What I really love about HelloFresh is the variety of foods my family and I are exposed to. We recently tried the bruschetta zucchini boats with couscous and melty mozzarella. For me, anything with cheese is going to be a winner, but it was such a great way to include vegetables in the meal that even the kids enjoyed it. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 80 moms and murder and use code 80 moms and murder to get a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash 80 moms and murder and use code 80 moms and murder to get a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. We've now had our third love bras for almost two years now, and I can say without a doubt, it's the best bra I've ever owned. After two years, my third love bra looks and feels just as great as it did when I first received it. And that's because third love designs their bras to fit you not the other way around. They design their amazing bras with measurements from millions of women and their bra styles are made to fit your life. Third Love offers a fit finder quiz on their website to help you find your perfect fit. And they carry over 80 different size options, way more than what you'd find in your local department store. Third Love has a team of expert fit stylists whose job is to help you find the perfect fit. If you aren't sure you found the right bra for you, you can connect with a fit stylist through chat or email. Plus, 3rd Love stands behind their products, and if for some reason you don't love your bra, worry not. With 3rd Love, you have 60 days to try your bra out, and if you don't love it, they will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. 3rd Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone, so right now they're offering our listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash murder now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash murder for 15% off today. And now back to the episode. 
Before the break, we were talking about how Tyler had just brutally murdered his parents and he was cleaning up the scene so that he could be prepared for the giant house party that he promised his friends he was going to be having. He spent three hours working to mop and wipe up the large volume of blood as best as he could. But if anybody were to look closely enough, they would easily see the signs of what had taken place. Once the blood was mostly cleaned up, Tyler then pretty much ransacked his own house. He used items from inside the home to pile on top of Mary Jo and Blake's bodies, including pieces of furniture, clothing, and even pictures that were hanging on the walls. I had a chance to look at some of the crime scene photos, uh, not the gory ones. I don't want to see those, um, but I looked at ones of just inside the house and in the room, and I really cannot even explain what Tyler did in there. It doesn't make any sense, but the whole place was turned completely upside down. There was just a mountain of stuff, just things that were in the master bedroom, mm -hmm. and the bodies were buried under all this stuff. Once Tyler was satisfied with the cleanup that he had done, he took a shower and got ready for his guests to arrive. The house was stocked with beer and drugs when the first group of teenagers showed up. Right away, the partygoers noticed that something was off about Tyler. He was dressed in his typical all-black ensemble, but it was obvious that he'd been doing drugs and he appeared to be very anxious this particular night. As people arrived, they noticed how strange Tyler's house looked. There were hardly any furnishings or decorations on the walls. As I said, Tyler had taken them all and put them in the master bedroom. But the teens at the party assumed that Tyler just put away the valuable things so that they wouldn't get broken that night. People came and went from the home in waves. At one point, the party had grown to over 60 people, and it was really quite rowdy. Several people played beer pong in the living room, while others smoked pot and took pills in other areas of the home. Tyler even told people that they were free to smoke inside the house and said that he didn't care. The party was completely out of control. The wild group of teens was quickly trashing the house, throwing their empty beer cans everywhere, raiding the kitchen for food, and burning holes in the carpet just to put out their cigarettes. As you would imagine, it was also very loud, and Tyler was more concerned about the police being called than he was about the fact that the house was being destroyed. A few of the people at the party seemed concerned and asked Tyler where his parents were, and he told them each different things. One person was told they were in Orlando, another was told they went to Georgia, and Tyler even told one person that his parents didn't even live there. Throughout the party, though, Tyler was quiet and reserved. At around one in the morning, he found his best friend Mike and pulled him aside, saying that he had something that he needed to talk to him about privately. The two boys went outside the home, and Tyler matter-of-factly told Mike that he'd killed his parents. By this time of the night, Tyler had been drinking and partying, so Mike wasn't quick to believe what he was telling him. But Tyler said, quote, Michael, I'm being real. I'm not lying to you, end quote. He told Mike to look around and see the signs for himself. Tyler pointed out that both of his parents' cars were still in the driveway, which wouldn't be possible if they had gone out of town. But still, Mike was skeptical. Tyler offered up even more proof. He told Mike to go into the garage and look for bloody shoe prints, and then to go into the house and look around for the signs of blood in certain areas. Mike did observe what appeared to be dried blood on the bedroom door frame and on the floor in the hallway. He went back to Tyler and demanded more information about what happened. He wanted proof that this was real. Tyler promised to show him the bodies, but not until the party started to quiet down some. But Michael wasn't going to wait. He knew his way around Tyler's house after spending plenty of time there hanging out, so he began wandering around looking at everything. Sure enough, the closer he looked, the more blood he saw. Eventually, Michael made his way to the backyard where there was an exterior door that led to the master bedroom. So the door to the master bedroom from inside the house was locked, but this exterior door was not locked. The door was blocked by all the items stacked in front of it, and Mike managed to push it open enough to look inside. The room was really unrecognizable and filled top to bottom with various objects, but Mike was able to use his cell phone flashlight to look around some. He spotted a leg sticking out from under the debris, and after years of knowing the Hadley family, he was absolutely certain that the leg belonged to Blake Hadley. At this point, Mike was very freaked out and he was extremely confused. So he went to find Tyler again so they could talk about it some more. He said, quote, you really murdered your parents. You did it. 
I guess I won't be seeing you for a while. I guess I should take a picture, end quote. So they actually did take a photo at this moment. This is after Mike has just learned that Tyler, in fact, did murder his parents and they were still inside the house. And if you Google anything about this case, um, Tyler Hadley, the first thing you're going to see is this picture of him and Mike. And it's very disturbing. Just the look on Tyler's face. He just looks so empty and just devoid of any kind of rational thought or emotion at all. Um, I'm looking at it right now. I I hadn't seen it. Yeah, that is very eerie to look at, knowing that that's the conversation they had just had. Right. So Tyler told Mike that he actually planned on taking a lot of pills and overdosing after the party was over. Instead of immediately leaving and calling 911, Mike hung around at the party for several more hours. He would later say that he was in shock and didn't know what to do immediately after learning that Tyler's parents were dead in their bedroom while dozens of teenagers partied in their home. And, and do you blame else, him? That makes yeah. total sense to me. Like I and being a teenager and your best friends just confess this. And what do you do? I don't fault him at all for, you know, trying to figure out what to do. No, I don't either. And especially like you said, when you're that age, like. It's. I feel like the decisions you make are when you're 17 are definitely different than the actions or decisions you would take at you know 30. It's yeah. Like you, just, you don't have the same kind of thought process and you don't jump to like the immediate right answer right away when you're a teenager. Right. So as the night wore on, Mike really struggled to keep this new knowledge he had to himself, and he started telling a few people at the party that Tyler's parents were dead. The few people that he told were shocked and really unsure about the story, but they decided that it was time to leave the party anyway because they just didn't want anything to do with whatever it was that was going on. At some point at around three in the morning, a neighbor called the police due to the noise coming from the Hadley house. Officers knocked on the door and Tyler spoke to them, but it was a quick conversation about keeping the noise down. And then the police left, which I just find so crazy that the police knocked on the door. Like while this is, yeah, this is the scenario. And they just, they were there and then they left. So the police ended up freaking out Mike when they showed up and he decided that that was his chance to leave the party as well. But several people did stay after that. Once Mike was out of there, he knew exactly what he had to do. He had to report what he'd seen and what he'd been told by his best friend. He didn't want to dial 911 and rat Tyler out that way, so he decided to call Crime Stoppers anonymously to report what he knew. Since it was the middle of the night, no one answered, but Mike left a frantic message full of all the details that he could cram in, including what happened and the address to the home. When the Crime Stoppers worker heard the message, she immediately dialed 911 and relayed the tip that had come in. She told the dispatcher that a 17-year-old allegedly murdered his parents in their home and that officers needed to respond immediately to check on the welfare of Mary Jo and Blake Hadley. Officers arrived at the home for the second time at 4.32 a.m. From the outside of the house, they could see Tyler pacing back and forth in the living room, then gathering up a handful of books and walking towards the bedroom. He appeared to toss the books inside the room before coming back out. A few minutes later, Tyler shut off all the lights in the house. He was unaware the officers had been called to the scene at this point, and at the same time that they were outside of his house, Tyler was inside posting on Facebook. He responded to messages from friends about what a great party he'd had, and he posted that he was planning to have another party that next night, which would really be that later that day because it's in the middle of the morning at this point. So officers then decided it was time to attempt to make contact with Tyler and find out exactly what was going on. They knocked on the door, and initially they did not get an answer, but he did eventually come to the door. Officers immediately noticed Tyler's bizarre state. His pupils were dilated, and he was behaving in a very frantic and unpredictable manner. As Tyler answered the officers' questions, it became very clear that he was lying to them. At some point, Tyler told them that he knew he was going to jail and to just take him there now. He was handcuffed and led outside when officers entered the home to take a look around. The first thing officers noticed was the disarray throughout the entire house. It was an absolute mess from the party that had been taking place for hours before the police arrived. Officers moved through the house, taking notice of the many areas where dried blood was present, including on the doorframe to the master bedroom, which was locked. Tyler, of course, refused to tell the officers where the key was, and he told them his parents were in West Palm Beach, 
But at that point, there was enough probable cause for the police to forcibly enter the locked room where they discovered the bodies of Mary Jo and Blake Hadley. Officers then quickly secured the crime scene and waited for the appropriate help to arrive. They were really careful not to touch or move anything around in the house at this time. As the early morning hours turned to dawn, crime scene technicians and news reporters began to show up. By that time, Tyler had been taken to the police station, and he was held there for nearly three hours before anyone came to question him. So a big thing in this case um, was the Facebook posts that Tyler made about this party and everything. Right. And I saw a screenshot of one of the posts and um, it was a post by another person on his timeline saying cool party. And then Tyler was like, I'm going to have another party. And then it was like one hour later, the same person responded again in the comments. And he was like, what happened? I heard there's a lot of police at your house, like what's going on or whatever. But it's just crazy to see those like in, you know, real time. Every- Right, because everything has a timestamp on Facebook. So you can see when he first said, you know, when he was replying, Tyler was replying, and then it was just a short time later that morning that the kid was like, what is going on? There's police at your house. It's just crazy that you have documentation of all that kind of stuff in the day of Facebook and, you know, social media. It was just before eight o'clock in the morning that Detective Meyer finally came into the room and started to strike up a conversation with Tyler, who, by the way, has been awake all night long doing drugs. So at first, she just asked him basic questions that were intended to break the ice. But before she could get into the heart of the matter, she once again had to read him his Miranda rights and be sure that he fully understood them. Tyler stated that he wanted a lawyer and Detective Meyer had no choice but to end the interview at that point. Several hours later, a judge signed a warrant allowing the police to search Tyler and collect his DNA as well as swab him for evidence. As investigators spoke with Tyler's friends, family, and neighbors, they got conflicting stories on what kind of kid Tyler was. Some people said they'd never seen any signs of violence or anger in Tyler, while others said they'd been concerned about him for quite some time. Officers were able to gather quite a bit of evidence that supported the idea that Tyler had been the one to brutally beat his parents to death. Some of the party goers that were interviewed tipped off the investigators about Tyler's Facebook posts, which, as I said, were later used as evidence against him. After the crime scene was processed and the two victims were officially pronounced dead, detectives returned to Tyler and informed him that he was being charged with two counts of murder. The case was pretty clear and there was plenty of evidence that pointed to Tyler being the only person involved in the death of his parents. Even though Tyler was a minor at the time the murders were committed, the charges were severe enough that he would be tried as an adult. He was taken to the county jail rather than the juvenile detention center, where he would be placed in isolation until his 18th birthday, at which point he'd be transferred to the adult inmate population while he awaited trial. On February 1, 2012, seven months after the murders, Tyler released a statement that said, quote, This is to all the people who followed my case. I want you all to know I regret what I did, but I have found God. I realize I shocked the world, and I'm sorry, end quote. Tyler was represented by a public defender named Mark Harley, and the plan was to get Tyler's case to be tried sometime in 2013. Unfortunately, Harley suddenly left his position, leaving Tyler high and dry and waiting for a new public defender to take over his case, so the trial was pushed back some more. In February of 2014, he finally made his way into the courtroom. Tyler entered a no contest plea, which basically means that we've talked about this on the show before. It's really confusing to me. It me too. pretty much means that he was not admitting guilt in the murders, but he was acknowledging that there was enough evidence to convict him of the murder. So this really is just like pleading guilty, except the main difference is that if anybody were to later sue Tyler in civil court, they would not be able to use his plea or his admission of guilt against him in their argument. Tyler's family sat in the courtroom while he appeared before the judge. One set of his grandparents said that they had forgiven him for the murders, but everybody in the family was pretty much rooting for him to have a life sentence. When the judge learned that Tyler wanted to enter a no contest plea, he had to ask all the questions to be sure that Tyler was aware of the implications. Because when you plead no contest, it means there will not be a trial and you're just going to accept whatever punishment the judge hands down. So Tyler said that he fully understood what he was doing. 
The prosecution asked the judge for two life sentences while the defense attempted to get the possibility of parole for Tyler, potentially in as little as 20 years. After hearing from the family and how deeply they were affected and that they all wanted to see Tyler behind bars for life, that is what the judge handed down. The judge said, quote, These attacks on his parents were painful, both physically and emotionally. I say emotionally because they realized their own son was killing them, end quote. Tyler's defense later filed an appeal for resentencing because they believed issuing a life sentence without the possibility of parole was classified as cruel and unusual punishment because Tyler was a minor at the time of the murder. So um, I read some information about how the statutes actually changed yeah. while his case was going on. So there was there used to be where you could not convict or you could not sentence um, a minor. You had to give them the chance for parole if they committed the crime when they were under age. Right. But then. The, they, they were in the process of actually uh, having that overturned and while his case was going on. So his case was actually very unique because it was one of the first ones where they were like, we don't really know what to do because you, this kind of happened like while we're in the middle of changing this law or changing this whole thing. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of interesting in this case, but the second judge that saw this case for a re the resentencing trial disagreed that this was cruel and unusual punishment, and he reaffirmed Tyler's two life sentences. In the years following the murders, the house that the Hadleys had built with the intention of growing old in was purchased by a bank. At the time the home was purchased, they did not know that there was such a gruesome story behind it. So the bank actually began renovations on the property, and they were nearly done when they found out mm. what actually had happened there. They already had installed new appliances, and they were putting fresh paint on the walls, and I assumed that the bank was, of course, going to put this house up for sale. Yeah. But when they found out about this horrific murder that took place, they decided to go in and take out all the appliances, everything of value that they had put into it, and they demolished the home entirely in 2014. Mm. Wow. So that is the story. And um, it's just so terribly sad and also terrifying to think about this happening at all. And just there's just no way of even wrapping your head around what happened in this situation. Yeah. It breaks my heart for the parents, of obviously, but with the mom, like I can just think as a mom, of course, um, you know, your kid who's kind of had a rough deal starting out and the trauma that she went through really having this baby that was in the NICU early on and had these issues, like those are very traumatic things for a mom, of course. And then probably having this, you know, feeling of like, you have some guilt with that, even though it's not her fault. I'm not, I don't know. I can't project that onto her, but just moms I've known who've had kids in NICU, in the NICU where it's kind of it's hard like you kind of always see your baby in that in that light so it's kind of I can see where she could be easier on him in a way you know what I mean like you right. even without meaning to and not to say that would have changed things but you just you really just never know like it just breaks my heart for the whole family it's it's just it's terrible it reminds me a little of the story out of Texas and why can't I think Whitaker, um, Bert Whitaker, Bart Whitaker. Bart. Yeah. Uh -huh. Reminds me a little of that of just like you kind of have it all and your family is loving and cares about you. And then how does this happen? It's, it's just hard yeah. to wrap your mind around. You can't really. It is. No, you can't. I know the, um, of course we will link all the sources for this episode in the show notes, but, um, there's so much here that like you, we, I couldn't even put into this episode because it was just, there's so many details and, and things. And there is a book that I also put in there, but the Rolling Stone article I mentioned is also going to be linked. And that is a g amazing article to read about this case, but there's just so many things that are, shocking, but that is the kind of mom that Mary Jo was. She was always very concerned for Tyler and she really would have done anything for him. And she always blamed herself for the problems that Tyler had. And so, like we said, he struggled all through his life with this idea that he was going to become overweight. And so it kind of led to an eating disorder and it was just this obsession. And Mary Jo blamed herself for a lot of these things. And I can understand as a mom, because that's all you want to do as a mom. You want to make your kids okay. Like right. by any means, if they're having a struggle of any kind, you just want to fix it. And Mary Jo really took that, you know, to heart. And she really wanted to just be there for her son and fix, you know, all of his problems and help him through the best way that she could. And, it's just a really, really tragic story. It was a very, very sad ending for everybody involved. Um, 
one of the things that Tyler uh, said that I read in several sources was that, um, and this is really also disturbing, but he told um, someone that the way he knew his parents loved him was that they did not try to stop him from killing them, Mm. which is just, yeah, it's just so, I mean, it's, it's too much. There's too much, you know, in this story. Um, so yeah, definitely. If you're interested in getting more details, check out the sources and there's a lot there you can pour through. And there's just so much more information about this case that, um, more than we could put into an hour podcast. So we have a scheduled week off next week, which is July the 21st, but we will be back on July 28th, one week later, just one week. We originally, I think, had two weeks off, but we just have one week off. So we'll be back on July 28th. No new episode next week, but you'll make it. I promise. Yeah. All right. So before we get out of here, we're going to do our last thing before we go. And because we had a Florida case, um, we decided that this would be... A great time to do um, a Florida man style last thing before we go. So um, we picked some Florida man headlines and we took out a word and we're going to try and guess what what <laughs> word we need to fill in the blank with. So I am super excited about this Florida one. man everybody, mad libs. Yes. Yes. Everybody loves a good Florida man um, headline. So I don't have any context to go with mine. I just pulled some headlines and um, we're going to kind of go from there. So do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, My first one is Florida man arrested with cocaine stuffed blank. What do you think the blank is there? Could literally be anything. Um, I know. Um, I'm going to say tacos. (laughs) (laughs) That would be delicious, but it's Lunchables. Oh. Food, though. You were right. You're on the right track. Yeah. Just a little more basic here. (laughs) All right. All right. Um, my, my first one is a Florida man attacks nephew over blank. Um, I'm going to say over, oh my gosh, I saw a bunch of these that was like slapped people with hamburgers and stuff. Um, he attacks nephew over remote control. (laughs) Undercooked noodles. (laughs) Fair, tough, but fair. That's, yeah, (laughs) that's so much. I would hate for that to be my arrest record and like have to agree you know yes I did these things so I really enjoy this one Florida man who allegedly threatened family with blank ends standoff after the SWAT team promises him blank so he threatens his family with doing this but they promise him this and he backs off oh man okay (laughs) if you get this you are actually a psychic there's just no way okay um let's say he threatened his family with a chicken. Okay. <laughs> I like where you're going. And he, he, they let's see, he backed off when they offered him. You can get this one. Gosh, I don't know. When you've when you are just up against it and you cannot leave the house and you are hungry and you want to order something quick and tasty and pizza. Yeah, so pizza. <laughs> he threatened his family with cold play lyrics. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't even know how that – how do you threaten somebody with that? I will you try just, like, and fix you. You say the lyrics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I love that. That's hilarious. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Uh, my next one is Florida man uses blank to fix neighbor's cars. I first think immediately, is it attached to his body? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> so he uses – a, um, he uses a gun to try and fix it. That would be very Florida, but no. <laughs> he uses Play-Doh. Aw, that's, yeah. that's a Florida man trying to actually help. I appreciate him doing that. That's it's a, It's a valiant effort, yes. It is. <laughs> so I like this one too. All right, Florida man threatens to kill man with blank, uses machete named blank. Oh, he's not going to kill them with the machete? Well, maybe. <laughs> he threatens to kill man with blank, uses machete named blank. Um, well, I'm going to say that he threatens to kill them with a machete because it sounds like that would make sense, but that's probably the wrong answer. And the machete is going to be named. Listen to the beginning. Florida man threatens to kill man with, kill man with, if I say I'm going to kill you with. I mean... 
if I'm being nice and I'm going to say, I'm just going to kill them with kindness. And then I'm going to use a machete <laughs> named kindness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's terrible, but I was like, oh, my, that was very clever. I got to say that. Hopefully that one's not true. That's terrible. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I have one more um, that is something, and I would have loved to have seen this. Okay. So Florida man dressed as blank pressure washes his roof. Oh, um, hmm. I'm going to say chicken just because I hope that's what it is. It's not (laughs) Spider-Man. I'm going to give you one last one, okay? Because I like this one. Florida, I liked all of them, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Florida man wearing blanks breaks into blank and gets bit. So he wears blanks and he gets bit after breaking into blank. Um, It's very punny. (laughs) What are the ugliest shoes in the world, Mandy? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I've owned them, and you could not believe I owned them, and I wore them out in public a lot, and they have holes in them. Oh, Crocs? Yes. (laughs) So he was wearing Crocs, and he breaks into a, what's something like a Croc? Okay, let me just say it then. Alligator farm. He broke into an alligator farm and got bit while wearing Crocs. Oh, man. Poor guy. It's very Florida. It's All the way around. Florida. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's some crazy Florida man headlines. Um, I actually like the ones that are recent are terrible because as soon as I type Florida man, I found some terrible things that have happened. Horrible things Florida happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I definitely had to dig down and find some that were not actually awful. Or but had yeah, to do with genitals. <laughs> Tons had to do with genitals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need to get it together down here. <laughs> <laughs> this did not help our case one single bit. Yeah. All right. Well, that was um, a very interesting last thing before we go. And <laughs> I think that's all the all the damage we can possibly do for this week. I agree. All right, guys, we will not see you next week, but we will see you the following week. Have a great week. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.